Welcome back, everybody. Our next speaker is Aaron Zimmer, uh, who is a senior developer at Shine Solutions. Ooh. Oh. Oh, that is so cool. Uh, please make her feel welcome. Uh, go click her. So, Netscape Navigator is dead. I think we can all agree. <laughs> oh. But why did it die? Um, how did it die? What were the repercussions of it dying? So we're going to have a look at the circumstances that led up to the death of Netscape. And then while we've got the body there, I guess, we'll take the opportunity to have a look inside and see how browsers actually work. But let's start right at the beginning. In the beginning, there were the proto-browsers floating about in the primordial data. They had names like Houdini, Silversmith, and things with hyper in them. Hyper-res, hypertext, hyperlan, hyperbbs. These things uh, were kind of like browsers. They used um, hypertext media to link documents together across a network and often over the internet. Um, so all of the, the ingredients of a browser were kind of there, like hypertext wasn't new and at this point the internet had been around for like 20 years. So the world was ready for the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web was created by Sir Tim Berners-Lee working at CERN in the late 80s, kind of early 90s. Um, the web is not the internet, so the internet is the connection of networks across the planet that is the infrastructure that these things run on, and the web is an application that runs on top of that and is the pages that you look at in your browser. Um, when Sir Tim invented the web, he gave us a few things. He created HTTP, which is the protocol that web browsers and web, ser web servers use to communicate with each other. He created HTML, which is the language that we use to describe web pages. Uh, he gave us URLs, which is how we find web pages on the internet. He created the first implementation of a browser and a server. And most importantly, he gave us an open standard. So this is one area where I guess the web differed from those earlier um, applications. Oh good, some knitters. <laughs> Um, was that the web from the beginning was open, it was available for everyone to use and to improve upon. So this was the first ever web page. It is actually available on CERN's page now, if you want to go and have a look at it. As you can see, it's kind of boring. Um, when HTML was invented, CSS was not. So there was really no way to make your page look at like anything other than text. Um, if you have a look at the source for this page, uh, it wouldn't pass code review in any sort of modern organization, let's say. And that's not because it was wrong. Um, it was perfectly valid HTML at the time, but HTML has changed a lot over the years. And one of the really cool things about browsers, with HTML at least, is that it's almost entirely backwards compatible. You can look at a page for any time in the history of the web, and that HTML will still work in a modern browser, with the exception of, I think, marquee and blink tags. And if you don't know what they are, go look up GeoCities. <laughs> <laughs> the first browser was um, named World Wide Web, which turned out to be a little bit confusing. So it was renamed to Nexus. It ran on the Next computer systems, which you might recognize as the company that Steve Jobs started when he left Apple temporarily. I don't think he started any companies since he left most recently. <laughs> um, as you can see, it's a graphical application. So web graphical web browsers actually predate text-based web browsers. And there's a lot going on. This, this application is a combination um, viewer and editor. So one of the early ideas behind the web was that the page author would be responsible for the content and the structure of the page, and they'd specify that in HTML, but it was up to the user what they wanted the page to look like. So the browser would let you change the styling on the page that you were looking at. Um, you, the idea being like, 
as the user, like, you know what fonts you like. You know what, how big you want the font sizes, what colors you want things to be. So it's up to you. The other thing is there were no inline images. So if you wanted an image in your page, you included a link and it would then open that image in another browser, in, what, in another window, in whatever application could view the image. Um, sounds a bit crazy these days, but at the time, most web pages were like scientific papers. So being able to control what it looked like yourself wasn't such a big deal. And also, you might want to have like the figures open while you read through the paper, so it was actually quite handy. Unfortunately, it did mean that the web wasn't that good for looking at pictures of cats just yet. <laughs> um, browsers took off pretty quickly. Um, there was a bunch more that were built in sort of really quickly after the World Wide Web was created. One that you might be familiar with is Lynx, the text-based browser, which was released First, first released in 1992. You might be surprised to hear the most recent release of that browser was in July last year. So Lynx is the, the oldest continuously developed browser in the world. This browser here is one called Viola WWW, which was the best browser at the time. Like to the point where it was the recommended browser at CERN, where Tim Berners-Lee had originally invented the web and written his own browser. Um, it had its own style sheet language, it had scripting, um, it had applets. So this isn't a picture of a chessboard, this is an actual chess game that you could play in the browser. Um, and it was, it was pretty great, but it did have some, some downsides. For a start, it only ran on Unix, which most people tend not to have at home. Um, and it could be quite difficult to set up and install, and there wasn't really good tech support. So the web sort of stayed in the domain of like the academic and scientific community. All that changed in 1993 when Mark Andreessen, who was working at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, created NCSA Mosaic. Um, Mosaic was rubbish compared to Viola. It had nowhere near the features, but it worked on a, multiple, on a number of operating systems, including Microsoft Windows, which was, is quite popular. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. <laughs> it was super easy to set up, and they had really good tech support, because there was a team working at, at NCSA who could provide that support. Um, Mosaic pretty quickly took over as the most popular browser, not just in academic circles, but it also had all of this, the new, the public, I guess, coming in and starting to use things. And Andreessen sort of abused that popularity a little bit. So at the time, there were no standards bodies controlling the web. What there was was a mailing list called www.talk. And people would get on this mailing list and they would discuss you know, the future of the web, how they think browsers should work, and they'd work together to make sure that new features were interoperable across other browsers so that you know, everything was still happy and great. So one day, Andreessen gets on the mailing list and he says, I'd like to propose a new optional HTML tag, mg, and it has a required argument of sus, which gets a URL, and an example is this here. And as usual, people are like, oh yeah, that's pretty cool, that's a new idea, something we've been thinking about, and everybody else was like, well, here's our suggestions on it. So the creator of the Midas browser suggested, well, maybe we should make it this icon, which is an actual word, and um, use href which is something that we use in other tags already um, to make it a bit more consistent. Uh, so Tim suggested that actually it would be better to extend the functionality of the A tag, uh, which is the tag that you use to link to other documents, so that instead of linking to another page, you could also tell it to embed the contents of that page within your page. So that would have allowed the display of images, but also um, videos and like whole other pages. One um, argument against the image tag was that if we implemented it, next week somebody's gonna suggest, let's put in a new tag for audio. And wouldn't that be awful? They, they didn't have it at the time. <laughs> um, the thing was though, Andreessen, he didn't care. He wasn't really there for the discussion. He was just there to tell people that that's what we're doing. 
So they implemented the mgr <laughs> tag in Mosaic, and the other browsers basically had to follow suit or just be left behind. So that was sort of the first, I guess, abuse of HTML standards, but you know, it did mean we could have cat pictures on the web. <laughs> so in about 1993, Andreessen realized that he was never gonna have complete control of the Mosaic project as long as he was at NCSA. So he did what all good entrepreneurs do, and he trundled off to Silicon Valley, and he met up with a guy named Jim Clark, and together they created a new company called Mosaic Communications Corporation. This is their actual website. It is still <laughs> on the internet. Um, you should totally have a look at it, I suggest. Uh, so they started working on a brand new browser that was kind of based on Mosaic, but not using the same code base. Internally, they referred to it as the Mosaic Killer, which they shortened as Mozilla. Uh, when they released it publicly, they released it as Mosaic Netscape. And for some reason, NCSA weren't real thrilled with them using the Mosaic name in this browser, so they changed it, and version one of Netscape was released in 1994. Netscape was massively popular. It quickly overtook even Mosaic as the most popular browser in the world and reached about 80% market share. Um, at the same time, the web was becoming popular sort of broadly and was being used for applications other than scientific papers like e-commerce. So this is the first ever Amazon.com web page. And the shortcomings of HTML were really becoming apparent because there's no way to style anything. There's no way for like stores to use their own branding on pages. Like all web pages had a gray background and black text and links were always blue. There was nothing you could do about it. So in response, Andreessen continued on his mission to destroy the HTML standard and started adding tags and um, attributes into HTML that would allow you to control the style of your page which led to things like this. <laughs> so this is the web page for the movie Space Jam from 1996. Again, I have no idea why it's still on the internet. Um, the whole thing is laid out using tables. Um, now we say that, right? And absolutely today, if you use tables for your layout of your web page, you're probably a bad person and you should look into that. But at the time, there was no other option, right? They had nothing else they could use. And the, like, the common advice was just ignore the semantic aspects of HTML to make it do like, whatever you wanted. So there's some excuse there. I'm not sure that there's any excuse for this. <laughs> so obviously, this made some people unhappy. Mostly people who had to look at it. But <laughs> But also the web standards um, bodies, the people who believed in semantic HTML and separating that presentation from structure. Um, Andreessen didn't care though. <laughs> uh, in 1995, uh, Netscape had their uh, IPO and they raised $3 billion and essentially kicked off the dot-com boom. Um, it's probably worth mentioning at this point that this at this time, browsers were like normal software. They're an application that you paid for. So a Netscape license was $99. So they did actually have a business model. <laughs> um, yeah, so things were going pretty well though. So they could just keep doing whatever they wanted to do. And Andreessen was so confident in the future of the web and that the future of applications was gonna be web applications and operating systems were gonna become pretty irrelevant that he made the claim that, that Netscape was gonna reduce Windows to a set of poorly debugged device drivers, which made Bill Gates sit up and take notice. But at this point, as far as anyone could tell, Microsoft didn't even know the web existed. Like, they had nothing to do with it. But when Andreessen made his claim, Bill Gates immediately put out a company-wide memo that basically said, now we do web. We are gonna win at web. So they needed a browser, and this was Microsoft in the 90s, so obviously they didn't write their own. 
they instead licensed a browser named Spyglass Mosaic, which was itself a commercial license of the original NCSA Mosaic. And version one of Internet Explorer was released in 1995 and kicked off the first browser war. <laughs> so it's worth mentioning around this time there were standards bodies by now. So in 1994, the first World Wide Web conference was held to, um, you know, for anybody who was interested in the web and the future of web development and browsers and all that stuff. The Internet Engineering Task Force had an HTML working group, which um, was created in 1994. In 1995, they released the first sort of HTML standard, which was HTML2, which was basically just a description of kind of what was out there. And in 1994, the World Wide Web Consortium was formed out of manufacturers who, were, who had an interest in the web. Um, so they, they were creating standards. The standards bodies were working, but they were kind of working slowly, and the browser wars were, you know, pretty intense. And so the browsers kept fighting, and the way that they fought, the weapons that they used, was to keep adding features to the different browsers. So Netscape added JavaScript, and Internet Explorer countered by creating JScript, which is basically just an implementation of JavaScript, which is still what they're using today. Um, Internet Explorer was the first ever browser to implement CSS. They did a super terrible job. Netscape retaliated by also implementing CSS, but doing it worse, <laughs> and in JavaScript, which is trendy these days, so I don't know if they were ahead of their time. <laughs> um, perhaps the worst of all, Internet Explorer implemented ActiveX controls. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So these gave the browser sort of access to operating system features, which meant that the browser was really tightly tied to the operating system, which was something they could do because they were the same company, I guess. Netscape had their own version called Encompass, but it was never, never had quite the same functionality. Things got pretty out of hand. In 1997, there was a launch party for Internet Explorer 4, and somehow, the IE logo from the party ended up on the front lawn of the Netscape building. <laughs> the Netscape developers sort of retaliated, obviously, with the Mozilla guy there. The plaque on his feet says Netscape 72 IE 18, which was their relative market shares. So Netscape was still in a pretty strong position at this point, but they were slipping. They've come into this fight with the superior browser and a huge market, a, a huge user base, but Microsoft have come in with their own user base and the ability to give their browser away for free, which people like. <laughs> so throughout all this, the standards bodies kept on working, and they, they did a lot of good work. In 1996, we got CSS1. In 1997, we got HTML 3.2, which was basically just a big description of all the awful tags that Netscape had created. Um, I think that was the one where there, there was actually a truce between Microsoft and Netscape, where one of them said, we won't put the blink tag in if you'll take the marquee tag out, <laughs> which is why those aren't in there anymore. ES1 is the first standard version of JavaScript. Um, when Netscape created JavaScript, they saw what had happened to HTML and how fragmented and different all of the um, implementations of it were, and they didn't want the same thing to happen to JavaScript, so they standardized it really early on. And the body that they used for this, to create the standard was called um, ECMA, and I have no idea what it stands for, I can never remember. But when they created the standard, they couldn't call the standard JavaScript, because Sun owned the Java trademark, so they called it ECMAScript. Um, we also got HTML4, which was an attempt to bring HTML back to its semantic origins. So it deprecated all of those shitty tags that um, had been added, like center and background color and that kind of thing, and we just had pure semantic HTML. In 98, we got a revision to that. We got ES2, which was actually just an, like an editorial change to the ECMAScript standard so that the standard met the standards for standards. <laughs> which was handy. And we got CSS2, which added stuff like um, 
Stacking context, so position absolute, position fixed, Z index, you know that thing that you just set to 999 and hope for the best? <laughs> in 1999, we got the final version of HTML4, and we got ECMAScript 3, which introduced uh, really cool stuff like regular expressions and error handling. So this was all really cool, and you know the standards were going pretty well, but the browsers, uh, they weren't bothered. <laughs> They were more interested in killing each other. Somebody from Microsoft was heard to say that their aim was to cut off Netscape's air supply, which um, I guess they did. <laughs> so in 1999, Netscape conceded defeat. Uh, oh, no, before even that, Microsoft went so far as to make an alliance with their arch enemies, Apple, who was struggling a little bit financially at the time, and Microsoft gave them $150 million in exchange for making IE the default browser on Macintosh for five years, which was, um, I guess, fun. <laughs> so in 1999, Netscape essentially conceded defeat. They said, we can't compete with Microsoft's practices, and they were sold to AOL. Um, they also started a law case, uh, a lawsuit against Microsoft, um, and they ended up fighting this case in the EU and the US, and in both cases, they lost. Microsoft were found to have been engaging in anti-competitive practices, which led to the destruction of Netscape. The consequences for Microsoft were unbelievable. Like nothing, they, nothing, nothing happened. So, Microsoft won the browser war, and then what happened? Pretty much nothing. Um, browser innovation just, stopped. To put things in perspective, between 1995 and 1999, Microsoft released five versions of Internet Explorer. That's more than one a year. IE6 came out in 2001, and IE7 didn't come out until 2006. So that's five years of essentially nothing. The standards bodies were really struggling too. Um, JavaScript had become really popular, especially the ability to make XHR requests, which allow a page to make a network request without having to reload the page. And so when uh, the committee that oversees the JavaScript standards started working on JavaScript 4, they were like, this is going to be everything for everybody. And they started building this massive spec that was going to cover like everything. And the people who actually had to implement this spec, they, they said no. no. Um, Microsoft and Yahoo just flat out refused to even consider it, which was like probably the reasonable approach to take. So these arguments continued from 1999 until 2008, when finally the decision was made to just give up on JavaScript 4 and start making a new version of uh, ES3, which ended up being released as ES5 in 2009. CSS had similar issues. CSS 2 came out in 1998, and they started working on CSS 2.1, which went back and forth between being a candidate recommendation spec and a working draft until 2011. So that was 12 years of arguing. And the issue there was that they had these sort of secondary specs that were holding up the release of the main spec. So the CSS working group kind of learnt from that mistake and after CSS2, the CSS spec has been divided into modules. So there's no such thing as CSS3, despite what that looks like. Instead, there's the CSS colors module level three and the CSS fonts module level three. And at the time, everything, everything was at level three. Now there's some level four stuff going on. So there's no such thing as one overall brand, um, version of CSS anymore. This still took 12 years to get done though. HTML had the worst of it all. The last version of HTML4 was released in 2000. HTML5 came out in 2014, and it had an audio tag in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did we recover from this awful, awful place that we were in? Well, a couple of good things happened. So, before Netscape was sold to AOL, they open sourced all their software. And AOL, to their credit, actually continued supporting the development of that open source software. So they, they were paying Netscape developers to continue working on this open source 
software while they were working for AOL. They brought out the Mozilla application suite in, I don't know, 2001 or something, which, which was good, right? It was more standards compliant, it was faster, whatever. But it was, all, it was this bit massive suite of applications. It was a browser, an editor, an email client, I know, probably a Gopher client or something. And people were like, this is fine, but really what we want is a browser. We want a fast, lightweight, standards compliant browser. And because open source is great, that was what happened. People took the browser code from Mozilla application suite and started working on a new browser, which they called Phoenix. Unfortunately, there was a BIOS manufacturer named Phoenix Technologies who weren't real keen on sharing the name. So the browser got renamed to Firebird. Unfortunately, <laughs> there was a database named Firebird and people thought it would be a bit confusing to have them name the same. So the browser got renamed to Firefox. Um, and around the same time, Apple actually released their own browser, Safari which was the first really popular browser to not trace its lineage back to Mosaic. Um, Safari is actually a fork of the Conqueror browser from uh, the KDE project. Um, Safari doesn't get a lot of love from web developers these days, but at the time, you know, it was actually the first browser to, act to implement CSS correctly, the first browser to pass the ACID2 test. Um, so these two browsers between them started chipping away at IE's market share. And by 2009, Firefox's market share peaked at 30%. So it was actually more popular than the current version of IE at the time. Things started going a little bit downhill for Firefox from then though, because in 2008, Google released Chrome, which was their, their browser. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. No. <laughs> um, and Chrome was pretty revolutionary at the time. It was, it's standards compliant, it was super fast, it was lightweight, um, not so much these days. <laughs> but it was fantastic and it quickly, well not quickly, it eventually rose to its current position of about 60% market share. Um, to round things out, in 2015, Microsoft released Edge, which is a complete rebuild of their IE browsers and is actually also standards compliant, although a little bit slow sometimes. And then we've got other browsers like Opera, which is popular in embedded applications, like in your TV, your game console um, feature phones. In the middle there is UC Browser, which is massively popular in Asia. And on the end, we've got Samsung Browser, which is massively popular on Samsung devices. Okay, so I promised I was gonna describe what's in a browser, and I kind of implied that we were gonna look at what was in Netscape. I completely lied. Instead, we're gonna look at a modern standards compliant browser, like this one here. Now, a browser is just like any other application on your computer, right? It's got a bunch of stuff going in the background, network connections and disk reading, writing stuff. I don't, I, look, I'm a web developer, I don't know. We're not gonna talk about that. Instead, we're gonna look at what's on the page. So in the browser, we've got this bit, which is called the browser Chrome, not to be confused with Chrome, the browser, <laughs> which was named because one of their intents was to have a browser with as little Chrome as possible, which I, I think Google might be rubbish at naming things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Chrome is like the window management, your menus, the tabs, um, all of the stuff that happens that's not the page that you're looking at. The bit inside here is the page that you're looking at, and it's controlled by the HTML engine. And HTML engines and browsers are kind of um, interchangeable, I guess they're kind of separate. So to give you an idea, Firefox is an open source browser which uses Gecko, which is an open source browser engine. Safari is a proprietary browser, but it uses WebKit, which is an open source browser engine based on KHTML, which was the engine from Conqueror. Well, still is, as far as I know. Chrome is a proprietary browser, which uses an open source engine called Blink, which is a fork of WebKit. Chromium, on the other hand, is an open source browser, which also uses the open source Blink engine. 
And Edge is a proprietary browser which uses a proprietary engine called Edge HTML, which I could not find a logo for, but it doesn't matter because they're changing to Blink anyway. <laughs> So this is what it looks like on desktops and also on Android phones. If you look at an iOS phone, however, it looks like this. <laughs> Everything uses WebKit um, just due to Apple's App Store policies. Okay, so we're gonna start with an HTML page and we wanna display it in our browser. When the browser receives the HTML page, it comes as a stream of characters over the network by network magic and the the browser engine needs to break this up into pieces that it can understand. So it passes this stream into the HTML tokenizer, which essentially breaks the stream into words that it can then use to build um, its own representation. So HTML has a couple of different kinds of words. We have start tags, so things like an H1 tag. Um, it could be a tag with an attribute on it or a self-closing tag. We have, oh, it's time for stand up. <laughs> Might miss that today. Um, we have end tags, which are just the closing tags for those start tags. Um, text, so the things that appear within your tags, and stuff like comments and doc types, which don't really affect the, the, um, the document that much. The HTML engine uses a finite state machine to, to do this tokenization. If you're not familiar with finite state machines, there's actually a talk on right now about using them. <laughs> so if you want to nip out, I guess we could wait. And <laughs> but just a quick overview is they have some kind of input stream that's coming into the system and a bunch of states. And each state has a list of rules associated with it, which tell it how to um, interact with the input, whether or not to create output, and then how to move to another state or stay in the same state. So if we start with our HTML tokenizer, we've got our input stream across the top, and we're starting in the data state. And the rules for the data state are that if we have a less than sign, we move to the tag open state. If we have null, then we throw a parse error. Otherwise, we're gonna emit a character token. So in our case, we've got a less than sign. So we're gonna follow this first rule, and we're gonna go to the tag open state. And then we'll look at the rules for the tag open state. So interesting thing that I learned researching this talk, Apparently, forward slash is named Solidus. <laughs> so the rule that applies here is that we've got a, a letter, A to Z, or capital A to Z, we've got an L. So we need to create a new start tag token, we need to set the name of that token to the current character, and then move to the tag name state. So there's our token up the top there, with L as its name. We can move to the tag name state, uh, the rule that applies here is just append the current character to the tag token name and stay in the same state. So we can add the A and we can keep going through. We don't need to read that every time. And to have used up all of those letters and then we're at a space. So the rule for a space character is to go to the before attribute name state. So we can go there. Um, then again, we've got a letter and the rule for this is to create an attribute and have the current character be the name of the attribute and the value of the attribute is gonna be an empty string. So we can add that to our token up the top there. So we've got an attribute F with empty string as a value. Um, and then we go to the attribute name state. And this, this just works like the tag name state. So we keep consuming letters and adding them to the attribute name until we run out of letters. Then we go to the equal sign, which says go to the before attribute value state. The before attribute value state says if you've got double quotes, there's like 68 of these states, like it's a massive big list. We get to the attribute value state, it's gonna work the same as the name states where we're gonna consume each character and add it to the value. So we can keep consuming characters until we get to uh, double quotes which says go to the after attribute value state. We go there, we've got a greater than tag, so we're gonna emit the token and then start again. So it's just basically, you go through and for each token that you could possibly encounter, there's a rule and you just follow that rule. It sounds simple. So we output our token and we go through and tokenize the rest and we end up with a bunch of tokens. So we've got some open tag tokens, we've got character tokens, um, each letter ends up in its own token. 
and we've got an end tag and some more open tags. Cool, so once we've got that, we're ready to start HTML parsing. Um, these things actually happen at the same time, so as each token is emitted, the parser picks it up and uses it, but uh, that was too complicated to do all at once. So the job of the HTML parser is to turn these tokens into um, the internal representation that the browser uses of the document, the document object model. In most cases, this is a tree. Um, Internet Explorer is special, and it used something else, something crazy, but mostly it's a tree, so we're gonna build a tree. We're gonna start with this HTML document, and we can build our tree out of it. So we've got on the this side, up the top, we've got our token. On the this side, we've got our tree ready to build. And this green bit in here is how we're gonna keep track of which tags are open so that we know where in the tree to attach the next node. All right, so we start with a doc type um, token. That just goes in the tree, it's boring. Doc types are a thing from HTML4 where because they tried to re-standardize HTML so much, it meant that to enable backwards compatibility, you had to say which kind of HTML4 you were using, and there was like strict type, which meant you were doing HTML4, and there was transitional, which meant you were doing whatever you felt like and just calling it HTML4. <laughs> <laughs> so our next token is our HTML open tag, so we add it to our tree, and then we put it in our stack. Um, then we've got the head tag, and we're gonna add it to our tree as a child of the HTML tag, because that's our like at the top of our currently open tag stack. Then we've got, um, oh, and we have to add that to the stack. Then we've got a link tag, which is like a style sheet, and it's self-closing, so it doesn't need to go in the stack. And we've got a closing tag for our head, so we pull it off the stack, and then the body tag is gonna go as a chart of HTML, because that's the currently top of the stack one. Um, and then we can keep going, we'll add all of the rest of our tags. When we get to our character tags, we just add them all as a single node. Cats, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and then we've got all of our closing tags, which are just sort of cleaning up um, the stack there. If you stuff this up and don't have properly structured HTML, browsers will just work it out. Like, the, the state machine that it uses for this just has a million different combinations of what to do if you stuff it up and how to recover from that. So HTML is pretty great like that. All right, so now we have our document object model ready to go. But we can't paint it on the page yet because we need to apply the CSS so that we know what it looks like. So to apply the CSS, we need to go through that whole tokenization and parsing process again. And it uses a finite state machine just like the HTML parser does. Um, the spec's not written quite as well though, so I'm not gonna go through it. <laughs> I'll just assume, apply the learnings from HTML to CSS. Um, so this will get applied to any time the HTML parser encounters a link tag with a rel of style sheet, a style tag, or um, a style attribute on an element. It'll stop parsing HTML, hand over to the CSS parser, deal with all of that, and then go back. And you're gonna end up with a data structure, something like this, which I have totally just ripped off from a list apart. Um, if you're interested in how, what goes into this data structure, I totally recommend that you read the article. It is, goes into a lot more detail than I'm gonna go into today. So once we have our document object model and our CSS object model, we can combine our powers <laughs> to create our page. So we need to go through our document object model and look through our CSS object model and work out which styles apply to each node in the tree. Um, you'll notice the text nodes don't get any styles applied to them, they just inherit whatever their parent is. Once we have that, we're ready to do layout. So we need to go through each element in the DOM tree and find out its width, its height, um, its borders, its margins, and its padding so we know how much space it takes up on the page. And then we're gonna put it on the page and see where everything sits. So you start with HTML, the HTML node, which is always a width of 100% and a height of 100%. So it just goes on the page, easy. Then we go to the head node, and the head node has some special CSS applied to it, which says display none. Display none means 
that neither this node nor any of its children are going to appear on the page. So just forget about them. So that's super easy. Then we have our body tag, which again is going to take up 100% width and height. So we just lay it on the page. And then we get to the actual content. So we have an article tag, which has got uh, a width of 100%, say, and it's got some margins on it. But we don't know how high it's going to be. It's got a height of auto, because the height of the element is going to uh, depend on the height of its contents. So we'll just provisionally put it on the page, and we've got the margin sort of there, and we'll work it out later. And we've got an HTML tag, which is essentially the same idea as the article tag. So we're going to lay it on the page with its margins, and it's going to tell the article tag, hey, you need to get a bit bigger. So the article tag will get a bit bigger. Then we get to our text node, and we stick our text in, and it says, look, that's not going to work. H1 node, you need to get bigger. So the H1 node gets bigger, and then the article node gets bigger. And then last of all, we have our image, which has a set width and height. It's going to go in the article tag, and again, it's going to say, hey, article tag, you need to get bigger. Um, and so once we've got to the end of our DOM and we've communicated back up to all the parents to say if they need to get bigger, we've got our layout ready to go on the page, which just leaves one final step, which is painting. And this is the process of combining our layout with the rest of our CSS to create a bitmap, which is what the browser is going to show on the page. So the rules for painting is we start from the bottom layer up and we paint every layer. Even if this layer is going to be covered by another layer, that top layer might be transparent, so you might be able to see the one underneath. So you need to draw all of them. And when you're drawing an element, you draw the background, then you draw the borders, and then you draw the content. So start with our page. Um, our HTML element didn't have any background, so we won't draw that. I mean, we, we, won't, yeah, we won't draw any background um, or borders. Then we've got our body element, which has a beautiful gradient. Um, so we'll draw that. It doesn't have any borders, so we can move on to the content. So the first content was that article tag. And the article tag will draw the background, which is partly transparent, so we can see the body through it. So lucky we drew that. Um, then we can draw the borders on the article tag, and then we can add the content, which was the H1 tag and the image, which I know everyone was waiting for. <laughs> And that's how you get from HTML to having something displayed on the screen. Now, I've missed out a bunch of stuff. So things like often you'll produce multiple bitmaps so that you can then animate parts of the page um, without having to redraw the whole page. And obviously, I didn't even touch on JavaScript because that's a whole 45 minutes or more in itself. But hopefully you can take away from this that this is how you get stuff on a page. And most importantly, that if you look back at the history of browsers, what's really important is having diversity in our browsers. So our current situation where everything runs on Blink is probably not ideal. But that's all from me. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I think we have time for one question. Going once. Thank you. Um, that finite state machine, is it part of the specification or is that an implementation detail? The spec is actually a finite state machine. Yep. Cool. I think we're done. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, we break for lunch.